welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Today, we are privileged to have a true American hero. Not only was he able to manage a difficult and demanding airplane, but he was able to use that airplane to carry an enormous bomb load into the heartland and enemy territory, deliver it effectively, and fight his way through the opposition to bring his aircraft back wounded but safe. What a privilege it is today to have World War II Liberator combat pilot, Bob Reese. Bob? Yeah, I've spoken to many groups, uh, and high schools, and uh, this is something. This is really a pleasure to be here. I'm sure glad. I want to thank those that are responsible for me being here. Now, to, just to mention a little about my past. I'm a Southern California lad, born and raised down here nine miles north of San Diego, called Pacific Beach. How many are familiar with Pacific Beach? Well, it doesn't look like that. In my time, it doesn't look like it does today. I went to elementary and junior high there, and I had a walk there. Nobody drove me. I had to walk to those schools, mile and a half away. And then I graduated from La Jolla High School. La Jolla, how many know La Jolla? Yeah. Very good. I graduated in, in the spring of 1941, and you know, um, uh, Hitler invaded, the World War II started when Hitler invaded Poland in September of 1939. And you know, he went all over, he had all of Europe and going into North Africa, if you don't know. And, uh, and in 1940, he was bombing London, England. So the, we here, we knew it was just the time before we'd be going in, right? <laughs> anyway, the draft started in 1941. And, uh, Drafting from 17 and a half to 35. That means you signed up, and a month or two later, they'd call you up and say you could take a physical. And if you passed the physical, you were 1A. And if you didn't pass it, you were 1F. At that time, I, I knew guys that wanted to be, preferred to be 1F. But anyway, uh, I waited and I enlisted in the, I enlisted in um, 42. I was going to college uh, at the time I started college. But um, I enlisted in 42, summer of 42. Yeah. Anyway, um, when Pearl Harbor hit, you all know, on December 7th of 1941. Well, if you were, I don't know how many of you were here at the time, but you know, there was a blackout here in the coast. All lights had to be out. Cars, you drove a car and that was tape covering the, 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 um, the what do you call it, the windows, the, the, yeah. And you carried flashlights when you walked around and you had air raid wardens come around and check you come around the house. I remember this before I went in the service. If, you, if, you, if they could see a light from the street, they'd come and knock, check, knock on your door and tell you where, to, where you turn the light on. And gas rationing came into effect. Gas rationing, three gallons a week. And food was also, you had coupons to go buy your food. So the civilians help here. The civilian people went through a lot too, not not just up service guys. Um, we, I'm just trying to point that out to you in case there are some here, some young kids around or young people. And I see there are, they are. Um, anyway, um, in, uh, um, I enlisted in 42 and they called me in the early 43. Now, why did I want to go in the Air Force and not the 
be drafted. I had never flown before, but I also saw a movie years before, All Quiet on the Western Front. Do any of you remember that All Quiet on the Western Front? Where they're in trenches and all that, getting muddy and eating uh, uh, K rations, sleeping on the, where they were sleeping. Uh, I, I said to myself, that's not going to be for me. <laughs> so, so anyway, that's what, and another reason, you fly, it's more dangerous. When you, you volunteer to fly, it's more dangerous than being on the ground. Because if you're hit up there, we're up there five miles, and if you're hit, if you're in, uh, in, if you're in pain, you got to wait until we all get back home. And uh, so, and, and uh, when I was up there, the, the fatality rate uh, before I got there was 50-50. 50 50 50 percent didn't come back. But remember, I was 20, 20, 21 years, 21 years old when I was there, flying that boxcar, they call it, the boxcar. It was a darn good plane. But you don't think of those things when you're young. And uh, you, you, know, you, you always think you're going to come back, but it's, a, it's very serious. I remember um, we had, um, I'll, I'll go into that later. But anyway, um, um, I went to service, and for the first month, I went to Lincoln, Nebraska to learn Army life, to know Army life. Man, Far, I had never been a mile away from my house. I, I was, uh, anyway, it was really something. Uh, you get up, they wake you up at five in the morning, go breakfast, and you march all day. It was, this was um, getting prepared for the service. And then from there, one month there, and then because uh, uh, Santa Ana was a pre-flight, uh, that's when you become a cadet if you do pass. We went to Missoula, Montana for three months to the University of Montana. School and physical exercise. That's what we did for three months. You live in the dormitories. Man, you can't beat that, living in the dormitory and eating down there. It was perfect. Um, so after three months, they shipped us down to Santa Ana. Well, there for the first week, you take tests in the morning and physical tests in the afternoon. Um, if you don't pass any tests, you're washed out. And they didn't hesitate washing. I mean, you, uh, every Monday through Friday, you took these tests. They, uh, they we'd wake you up in the morning, you fall out in groups, and um, they, they'd read names. And if your name was read, you didn't pass. So out you go. So I waited until Friday, Reese's low, low, low on the, alpha, on the alphabet. So they, they, they start with A, B, C. And I'm waiting for R's and I'm quenching one more time. No, nope, they didn't mention me, so I passed. Anyway, from there you start your training in, uh, in pre-flight. And that's school in the morning, physical in the afternoon. That's every day for three months. At the very end, uh, three months, and they tell you before we leave that whether you're going to be a pilot, navigator, bombardier. Everybody wanted to be a pilot, but we had to have bombardiers and navigators. So, but I always wanted to be a pilot. So, yes, I became a pilot. And now we were cadets. Before we were aviation students, now we were cadets. And um, from there, I went to Lincoln, I uh, know, to. Um, Santa Maria for primary, and I learned to fly with in a steerman. I mentioned this, somebody over here that came over in a steerman, right? That's where I learned to fly. Um, uh, learning the slow rolls, snap rolls, uh, loops, and chandelles. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> anyway. Heck of a nice little plane. Uh, we spent three months there, and after you, if you pass, they give you seven hours to solo that plane. If you couldn't, if you, 
If you couldn't solo in, if you didn't solo in seven hours out, you'd go. They had so many, they weren't going to waste time with one person. So you had a solo in seven, you pass. So and I, after the primary, I went to Basic, which is in Lemoore, uh, uh, Fresno, in Fresno there, and flew the BT-13. Familiar with the BT-13? <laughs> anyway. Um, I, I, and they gave you uh, eight hours to solo that one. It's a heavier plane and so forth. And the same thing, fly, fly anytime during the day, they assign you when you're going to fly and go to school and physical. They're physical all the time. Uh, and anyway, you got to pass everything or else they throw you out. And then from there, they three months, and went, I went to advance. I was in Douglas, Arizona. That's where I flew the twin engine. I, when I got the twin engine, I knew I wasn't going to fly fighters. So um, three months there, and they give you nine hours to fly that twin engine, 18-9. And, uh, and I did that. And um, Douglas, Arizona is right on the border of Arizona down there. And my, one of my fellow in the same, uh, same room shared, we should, there was four to a room uh, in advance, and this one fella uh, couldn't land the plane. And uh, the, the instructor, the instructor um, told him, tomorrow I'm gonna, I'm gonna have the check, you go up with the check pilot. Once you go to the check pilot, you, you might as well Call it a day, but on the way home, on the way uh, that following morning, we met there at the plane, and my instructor says, uh, "Reese, take rule up." And they were rule, say rule, Reese. My other two boys were Roth and Ross. We were uh, roommates. Well, I mentioned these things because of what happened. Anyway, um, in um, rule couldn't land it. And he told me, I know I can land at Reese, but he yells at me when I'm landing. Well, he did that to me. I finally told him to quiet down, I'll land this plane for you. So the following morning, I told the instructor, look, no, the instructor tells me, uh, Reese, will you take rule up with you today? I can't, the, he, the, the instructor, the check pilot is not around. So he came up, we went up, and I had him seat in the, in the pilot seat. To, to, and we went out to a nearby field, and all we, all we did was shoot landings. I had him fly the whole time shooting landings. He landed perfect. So I went back, and when we landed, I saw the instructor and I told him what had happened. Oh, great, he says, uh, okay, tomorrow you'll go up with me. So he passed. And I'll never forget, I left, going to my room, which was quite a ways, and I could hear him yelling way back there, Hey, Reese, Reese. And he jumped on me and hugged me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, little stories like that I remember because it made me feel great. Now, the other sad part is my two other roommates, we were flying at night. And they called us in. We were over the Tucson area. And there was fire at the start of the runway or, or the takeoff, I forget. We landed, went to bed. Next morning, I see this cobra going through the bunk, through the st stuff of, this, of the, uh, my roommate there, Ross and Roth. They're the ones that cracked up. They cracked up that night. I mentioned these things because we lost, we lost, I saw so, we lost so many in training also. It was not just in combat. Uh, just think of that. Don't, I don't want to think about it. Anyway. We, um, from there, they assigned me to a B-24 in Pueblo, Colorado. That's where I learned to fly, and we got the crew in Pueblo, Colorado. That's a nice city, Pueblo. How many know Pueblo, Colorado? Nice, nice, yes. <laughs> anyway, um, um, uh, that's why we flew there for about three months, had enough training, got the crew there, flew formations, flew, prepared to go overseas. And uh, sure enough, after three months, they, they sent us to Topeka, Kansas, where we got all our, our flight clothes, our, 
our dress, our gun, our 45, and mask, the oxygen mask, headgear, head, we got it, all that there in, uh, in uh, Topeka, Kansas. And um, from there, we went to New York, caught a ship to take us over to England. Now, the funny thing there, getting on board that ship, I can remember like it was yesterday. What, guess, guess what they were playing, what I was hearing. Over there, over there, and we won't come home till it's over, over there. Getting on that, and I'm, I'm getting the, really something. Uh, anyway, we got on there. We were on, the, we went on convoy, which means you go as fast as the slowest boat, ship. And unfortunately, officers were on the top deck. And uh, every morning I'd get up and look for the sun. As long as it was in the east, as long as we were facing the sun, we knew we were going, I knew we were going to Europe. I, that, I, that's what I said to myself. But the old guys would come out later, just because you're going east doesn't mean that you're going to be going to Europe. You could, we could go around the, uh, the Cape down there and go to, go to the Pacific. Every morning I'd get up and look for the sun. After 10 days, we were still, our sun was still there. The guy, the guy finally said, no, you're all going to England. Boy, that was a relief. What a difference between England and the Pacific. Because in England, we slept in Quonset huts. It's in a bed, eating a restaurant, well, well, like a restaurant, and sleep good, yeah. But when you flew, you flew for 10 to 12 hours. I'm gonna tell you about a mission for a B-24, or for all bombers. They wake you up at three in the morning. Remember, you're 19, 20, 21, 202 years old. Most of the pilots I knew were 21, my age. Yeah, 21. Anyway, they'd wake you up, and uh, they didn't yell at you. The guy come, come to them, okay, time to get up. We'd get up, not a word is said, because now we know it can be serious. And we get dressed, we go outside, and outside of the building is a restroom and, uh, where you can wash up. And we, then from there, we go to breakfast. And breakfast, they sit down dinner. You're waited on by English gals, waitresses. They, they offer their services. And uh, not, you could hear pin drops when you're eating. Remember, you don't want to think about it. Because at the time I was going, when I got there, chances of coming back were 50% when I got there. Uh, that, but when you, you, you don't really want to think about that. So anyway, but in the back of your mind, you, it's there. So anyway, um, we have breakfast, good breakfast, and then we go to briefing. Briefing's a room about this size and chairs like you have there. All the officers are there. The enlisted men are another briefing. And up on the stage is a, is a map covered up um, um, and um, everybody is curious where we're going. That's the first thing. But I remember my first mission, you go up with an experienced pilot because we don't know what to expect. So I'm here for the first time I'm here in this and we're going to Hanover. Where in the heck is Hanover? It's, it's, well, it's, it's west of Berlin. It's about 100, 200 miles from Berlin. And, uh, but when they re remove, when they remove the curtain, all the experienced boys there, you hear a, oh no, oh no. That was, it was dangerous. That was one of the big targets. Anyway, so I didn't know what we were getting into. We got on the plane and, uh, oh, before, before that. From there, uh, after the briefing, then we go change our clothes, put on our flight clothes. And um, that's a heated suit, and then an overall on top. Our, get our mask, our head, head uh, cap, our shoes, and uh, 
And then we go out, and the, what, I, what we're doing is we have, we have lockers, and while we're doing this, the priest comes around and yells out, all you fish, fish eaters, we're having communion at the end of the hall here. So all fish eaters went down and had communion. Now you know that serious when that boy comes on. Yeah. Uh, you never forget these things. You never forget them. Anyway, uh, and to make matters worse, we get from there. You get on trucks to take you out to the plane. Well, the the crew is uh, the the crew that takes care of the planes. They're they're scattered all over the field, and then they go up and and uh, you. Ask, and they say the plane is fine, so you get on, you get on board. Well, wasn't my first mission, so we had the experienced pilot flying on the left seat, and I flew on the right. So we went up, and uh, not a word. Everything is very quiet. Nobody's yapping, and uh, so we get on the runway to take us to the to the to the, to the runway. We we start lining up. And um, as you as you line up on the runway to take off, guess who's there at the runway, at the head? The the priest, the chaplain. He's right there. For every plane that takes off, a sign of the cross. And you're looking at him, and you say, "Man, this, this has got to be serious." <laughs> anyway, so. Now, this is my first flight, so I, I'm, I, I don't know what to think. So here we take off. It was a nice sunny, was a, I remember it was on Sunday, and it was sunny like this, just clear as a bell. Um, and so here we take off at six in the morning, and we're um, climbing. After we get to pass the channel, then you start climbing, you put your oxygen mask when you get 10,000 feet, and you keep climbing. Uh, you get to the target around, you get to the IP, which is the initial point. But prior to that, you're loose, you're flying loose, not close, but the IP to the target is when the lead uh, tells you, okay, tuck it in, tuck it, get your planes close, so you get a good bomb pattern down there. Now remember, you're getting, getting close, and you're flying steady, and no maneuvers. You just, you're sending ducks up there for the yak yak. And sure enough, we were close to the front. As soon as we got to the, near the target, here comes these shells. Boom, boom, exploding in front of us. And, uh, and, and, the, and the ship is doing this, just bouncing. And I'm here, sweat, just sweat. And it was, uh, just, uh, I'm telling you, you don't know what fear is until you experience this. I'm telling you. Uh, and I said, oh, what? And then I'm telling myself, what the heck did I get into? <laughs> Man. And then sure enough, right next, we're flying off this guy's wing, and he gets a direct hit right on the wing. The plane does. And I'm wiping myself there. I'm telling you, it, it, it's serious business. And after that, we drop our bombs, and that old plane pops up. But we, we carried 6,000 pounds. The B-17 carried 5,000 pounds. So that's a heck of a load that you drop, and you're always waiting for, to get rid of your bombs. Anyway, um, uh, we, we drop 1,000 feet to get to the planes, because that, those, that ACAC spreads you out. Uh, you can't get too close. They just spread out, whether you want to or not. Anyway, you, um, you rally, and uh, Get back together because here comes the fighters. And they, they didn't have 51s in my early days there. They didn't have any, we didn't have protection. And here they come. And uh, uh, I can see shells coming everywhere. Every 10th shell is a, is a tracer. So you can see them coming. And you're sweating, but it's not gonna happen to you. So anyway, we get by that. And here, and all of a sudden, we're in the clear. Now we got to get home. Uh, still, everybody's quiet. We're over, we're over France. But once you see England, that's when all the chatter starts. That's when the gunners start yapping. Did you see that? Did you see that? 
Well, when we got back and landed, my, my waist, I, had, I had two waist gunners. One was 17 and the other one was 18. He, he came up to me and said, you know what, he was, he was in um, Italian descent. And you know what he was doing? He was praying all the whole time. He didn't want to tell you because you're allowed to get angry. And so, listen, I grabbed a hold of, I forget what he called him. And I said, don't worry, I was just as scared as you were. Yeah. Anyway, that was our first mission. And then came the second, third, and fourth. But they, they, I, on the next mission, I had them, we, no, you went on your own. And, uh, but you think about what you saw the first mission. But I guess they know it's not going to be a rough one, so it wasn't. It wasn't a rough mission like the first one. And that went on uh, either heavy, mild, or, or light. And that went on for 35 times. I went to Berlin two or three times. I flew there. I was a wingman for Jimmy Stewart. You know the actor Jimmy Stewart? Well, I was his wingman. I talked to him. He was a heck of a nice guy. And I never forget him when I talk to groups. So don't forget Jimmy Stewart, because he was one nice guy, and he served his country. Thank you. I, 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 uh, I saw Stewart the last, in 1984 in Palm Springs, the last time I saw him. They had a reunion for the Second Air Division there in Palm Springs. I mentioned this to a group I, I had talked to earlier, that that's, what I, that's the last time I saw him. And they, this gal pops up and says, do you remember you? I, to, I told her, my answer to her was, being the only American of Hispanic descent in the group, yes, he remembered me. <laughs> Which is true, yeah. In fact, I never ran, I only ran into two as, Americans of Hispanic descent, and two, two of them in my whole life. I mean, my whole time I was in the service. One was my brother who flew, flew B-29s, and my good friend that flew P-51s. So that's how it was. I don't know why they went more of them, but maybe they didn't like to fly or something. Anyway, um, and I haven't run into one yet. I have to talk, and all my talk and everything. So anyway, we landed. We land about 12 hours, 10, 12 hours later. They go to debriefing. They, in fact, Stuart was in that debriefing uh, group many times. And uh, they check and ask you what you saw. And uh, well, when you're not flying, you see a lot. But when you're flying the plane, you, all, you, all you're looking at is the next plane you're flying off of. So it's normally the gunners that say what, what, they, what they saw. They didn't, have, they didn't permit cameras at the base where I was, uh, you, uh, but my nose gunner sneaked one in and took these pictures. Well, that's England. That's, oh, that's, that's a sad, you, you go over there today and see all those cemeteries, all these veteran cemeteries. You know, I, I, know, I, I know I didn't mention, we lost 408,000. American service people all over the world. 408,000. The only guy that, the only com country that beat us was uh, Russia and China. But that's a lot of kids. Because 90% of those that passed were teenagers or in their 20s. I know in my base, we were all in our 20s. Those that flew were all in our 20s. Yeah. That's what's sad about it. And I don't want anyone to ever forget that either. 408,000. That's four Rose Bowls. Rose Bowl holds 102,000. There's four of those. All that, you see that mass of humanity. Four of them. My dad came here in 1900. He was 15, 16 from Mazatlan, Mexico. How many have been in Mazatlan? Anyway, that's our nursery. He learned the nursery business from a gal that's quite a namesake there in San Diego, Kate Session who was instrumental in landscaping Balboa Park. So that's our nursery. That, that's our home, which is still there today in Pacific Beach. When he came to this country, he didn't, he didn't know how to speak English, read or write. He learned to speak right, and read English because a lot of our work was in La Jolla. La Jolla. 
La Jolla, uh, a lot of money in La Jolla. That's why he, he uh, uh, progressed like he did, and and we were able to live through it without, because the Depression was in the 1930s. Anyway, uh, and one thing, he, my old man, and I use that expression today when I talk to kids, high school kids. No drugs, he was like, no, no drugs, no um, gangs, and school, school, school. He emphasized that. Here's a guy who never went to school, but that's what he did. And that's what I tell the kids today. And the teachers always thank me, because it's so true. I'm talking to kids today, sure different than my time, I'll tell you. They got to, well, in the first place, they don't teach history. And second place, they don't, um, I'm not saying all of them don't, but I'm one, the ones I've, many that I've spoken to. And they all, uh, they don't have physical, physical exercise. I can't believe that. So anyway, that's my dad working out in the backyard there. No, that's the high school, the Hoya High School that I went to. They knocked it down and now it's a single story. It didn't look like, <laughs> yeah, it looked like that when I went, yeah. That's my Missoula, Montana. Remember I mentioned some Missoula, Montana? That's all us recruits, 1943. What? I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see that one. Hey, I'm there, I'm there. Ah, that's a closer look. Here, right in the middle. Right in the middle. The only Hispanic in the group, so you've got to pick me up. <laughs> That's Santa Ana, the, the entrance to the Santa Ana Air Base. That's how it looked. Today it's the um, Orange County Fairgrounds, but that's the way it was in the war years. There's my mom, my mother and dad and my brother. We were cadets there. Yeah, we were cadets. That's our base in, in Douglas, Arizona. That's where I got my wings. We flew out of that base there. Yeah, that's the reliable B-24. I don't want no B-17 pilot popping up here and telling me. Uh, <laughs> When, when I see a B-17 pilot, and I met that flu, here we go. Here we go. There's brother and I at home. My brother was also a professor after at the UCSD, history professor. He wrote 15 books, which are out today. Yeah. He took my dad seriously. School. Ah, <laughs> uh, there's merry old England and, and France over here. That's Hethel Air Base. That's where I was stationed. I've been, we've been back there. I've, I've taken my wife there on a couple of occasions. And she knows, she's been there where I, she's been to Hethel, where I flew out of. She saw the whole thing. So when I mentioned Hethel, she remember, she knows. She met a lot of my flying buddies back there too. They're my group there. This guy on the left, the far left, he lived, he's a pilot next, next, next door. Very, relig very religious. And he wrote to his girlfriend every night, every day he was writing. He, every time I looked in his room, he was writing letters to his girlfriend. But he was, he went to church, I think, umpteen times a week. Anyway, very religious. When I had about 20, 25 missions, uh, when you have about 20, 25 missions, you take up a green crew that just gets there. A, a green crew you have to go up with an experienced pilot. I didn't know this, but when I came home from a mission, I looked up on the board, my name wasn't on that board to fly the next day. So the first time and the whole time I was there, I went to the bar, the officer's bar there. I never went there and uh, started drinking. And about uh, one o'clock or 12, went, I went to my room. And uh, my, my, in my room is where he played cards. Learned the English pound, the exchange. That's where he learned it, right there. That's where he played, a bunch of, bunch of guys playing. If you didn't fly, we'd meet there, play cards. Anyway, I went, as soon as I got in the room, all the guys yell at me, hey, Reese, Call operations, they've been paging you all, all night. I went in the hall, got the phone, called, told them who I was. Uh, they said, forget it, we got Benko next door to go in your place. 
great. So we went to bed. That morning, I feel the whole room, the whole place shake. About six in the morning. About nine o'clock, here comes his navigator, bombardier, four, he came to the room. Guess what? Benko got it this morning. The guy that took my place, he got it. Crash. In those days, they didn't go, they didn't go in, inspecting what happened. Did this fail or that fail? All right, so the plane cracked up. So that's old George. Hey, come on, nice guy. Hey, come on, nice guy. Well, that's the, that's the 8th Air Force. All these markings, my marking was the uh, top third from the left. Third from the left, that was the 389th. So when you were up there, you saw these tail markings. So my group, that's what, that was their tail marking. And it's only I forget there was, the 8th Air Force consisted of, um, of um, uh, three divisions. First and third were B-17s, and the second was a B-24. And each, each um, they had, we had, division had five wings, five wings. Each wing had uh, three groups, and each group had four squadrons. A squadron consisted of 12 planes. So if you figure out real quickly, you know, where you got the 1,000 planes that bombed Germany. When you see a thousand planes five miles up, remember we're five miles up. Man, the things down there look very small. But remember, five miles up, and uh, you're all on oxygen, and when you're flying, you're just looking at the next, when you're flying the plane, you all do is look at the next plane. All right, this fellow, four from the left, that's Jimmy Stewart. He was six, he was six foot three. Tall, thin fellow. We had reunions there at the, at the Phoenix Club there in Anaheim. How many know the Phoenix Club? Two. German Club, the German Club. Well, that was taken as the old timers, the veterans. These fellows all belong to veterans groups there where I, I'm a member of. Uh, that's the, that's the, the tail, see the tail? Black with white in the middle. Well, after, after I went to work, after this off on the side, I worked on, uh, we started a plant there in, in um, New Jersey, Piscataway, New Jersey. And then I slept in a, uh, we stayed at the Holiday Inn. I'm bringing this up because you'll see. I went, went to go to the bar after working all day. And I see this tall blonde guy behind the bar. And I hear his accent, and the accent he had, I said, I'm familiar with that accent. Where are you from, I asked him. Germany. Germany, World War II, Luftwaffe. That's how he answered me. Uh, bomber pilot, B-24s. Oh, I remember you were the, what, tail, what was your tail marking? And I told him, black with white stripe in the middle. Oh, I remember you. Now isn't that something? 30, 40 years later, Here's a bartender that was a fighter pilot was attacking us. And here we're having a drink. Man, small world. There's my plane right down the front. Beautiful. That's the, uh, yeah, the cruise. There's nine guys there. I'm top left in the very top up there. There's my crew. The oldest guy there is 24. You know what they called him? The rest of the 17, 18 year old called him Pop. Ah, oh, there's my dear wife and I, years later. <laughs> that's, the, oh, that's the only county fairgrounds. But that was Santa Ana, at the time, Santa Ana Army Air Base. That's what it looked like. Nothing around it, but you know what's around it today. That's Washington, D.C. There's a group, the Honor Flight. How many have heard of the Honor Flight? How many have been to Washington, D.C., the memorials there? Oh, everybody. Well... I went with an honor flight uh, about two or three years ago out of San Diego. Uh, and we, uh, that's, for a veteran, you really, it's a great feeling. They, uh, we had a charter plane out of San Diego, took it right to Baltimore, and Baltimore, they 
bus to Washington, D.C. And uh, you spend all day, they leave on a Friday, spend all day Saturday at the Washington, D.C. Memorial. That, that's the World War II Memorial. And you come back on Sunday. But the groups you meet, you see at, um, at the terminals, man, there's mobs I'm waiting for you to come by. And uh, patting you on the back, women make a special effort to come and hug you. <laughs> and, uh, and, and anyway, it's a heck of a trip. That goes on all the time. There's one here in Orange County now. Uh, so if you on a flight, I think donations is what helps. There we are in Washington, D.C. The fellow that is with me, and oh, the fellow on the top right, that picture on the top right, he's the man that, that handles the flights out of Orange County. And on the left side was this gal who we still see today. My wife knows her. Mel? Anyway, I got to mention this. When she was a guardian for two, two veterans in wheelchairs, so my friend and I, he's a 51 pilot, we always, we wanted to say hi to her. And I remember, uh, actually we wanted to hug her, but uh, uh, we'd get so close to her than the, the, I mean, those, those guys in wheelchairs. Ah, that's close enough, that's close enough. <laughs> there he is, that's my friend there. This fall and I, we went to elementary, junior high and high school. The only one around today in my my group. I just talked to him the other day. The only one left. All my other old buddies are gone. That's that. That's the uh, Korean Memorial. Lucky Bastards Club. Uh, you can say that again. Man, just plain luck. Yeah. Waiting for everybody to read it. I got to ask this question before I forget. How many World War II guys do we have here? World War II. Raise your hand, please. You were very small, very small, and we're fading. Oh, there's my two buddies. They also of Spanish descent, these two guys. They flunked out, they didn't pass. They were with me in Lincoln, Nebraska, Missoula, and in and, uh, pre-fly, they flunked out of, one guy couldn't fly the plane, and the other guy couldn't fly instruments. So they washed them out. Oh, there, there's that guy. That's me sleeping. <laughs> well, don't forget, when you fly for up there, tw you're up from three in the morning, you go to bed about eight or nine o'clock in the evening. You're tired. So they thought they would take a picture of me. That's where I slept, top bunk. I'll never get that room. It's a Quonset hut, yeah. There's my full, yeah. There's the oldest guy right there in the middle. The radio operator. Oh, there's that fellow again. <laughs> cadet. Well, I was a cadet there. Yeah, I'm a cadet there, yeah. I think I was 19 or 20. 20 I was 20 there. Now, that's the one that's over where? Oh, here. We were at the Pelican Club not long ago. I, uh, I didn't speak, but this they had these out in the hallway. I didn't see them. My wife spotted this out in the hall at the Pelican Club. You don't know where the Pelican Club is? Up on Highway 5 in Newport? Well, that's where that real exclusive club, real nice. There are the four officers. That's me in primary. In the, uh, when I saw where I learned to fly the steerman. We had to use those clothes because you're in a cock, open cockpit. So you had to use that. And there's that overseas. Yeah. That's what we wore. The man below, in the bottom middle, that's a little Italian that was praying that over the target. I belong to three veterans groups here in Orange County. One is the Freedom Committee. How many have heard of the Freedom Committee? Where's Dave? <laughs> we we um, comprise the World War II Vietnam and Korean vets. We're out at, uh, at the Lions Air Museum. No, no, that's not nothing. And we meet the second Wednesday of every month and uh, talk about old times. 
But what we do is go out and talk to high schools and middle schools about your war, World War II, Korean War. It's amazing what little they know. And the purpose is to hear the story from the one that was there, not read it out of a book. What I told you is authentic. That's the way it was. No, I'm not making up anything. I was there. I can say I saw that. I can, uh, I'll never forget. Okay, another thing, that's the Freedom Committee. The next is the, um, the um, honor flight. I belong to that group. I'll go talk to the groups on that. We'll go and, um, and um, ask for donations from groups or anybody to support these uh, uh, veterans to go to Washington, D.C. and see them. They're very grateful, believe me. That's, that's a good purpose. It's amazing how, how it makes you feel when you see these people. That you finally say to yourself, man, they are grateful for what you did. Remember Tom Brokaw's words, the greater generation. Greater generation before, because we went through a depression and World War II. There were 19 million of us in the service, all branches of the service. And lastly is the um, is, um, Lions Air Museum. That's in the Orange County Airport. I'm there every Friday from 10 to 1 uh, with my friend there, my agent. <laughs> no. Anyway, uh, and Dave over here is another member up there. Anyway, that's, that, there we talk to people from all over the world. We got vintage planes. We got the only thing we don't have. We have. We have. We don't have the B-24. We don't have that plane there. We have the B-17. I have to look at that every Friday. <laughs> anyway, um, and they, they people from all over the world. I had a gal. I had a gal here because the guys wander all over the room, and this one friend told him. Uh, they asked him a question told this gal, if you want to meet a B-24 pilot that bombed, they bombed Germany, I'll take you over. And so he, I mean, you, he pointed, pointed her, pointed me out to her. And here, here comes this gal running to me like this, ready to hug me. And I'm looking like that, what's going on here? So she comes and hugs me. Naturally, I hug her back. So she was 15 years old. She was a German Jew. She was 15 years old when we were bombing her place where she was living. She was very grateful because the Germans were real close to her. They were going to pick, take her, capture her, take her to camp. She lived in the forest for the rest of the war, her with her parents. So she was very grateful. I've met guys, I met a guy just in that reason there was a Holocaust. You all heard of the Holocaust? His dad was in this group where the Nazis just blasted away at him, and he fell in a trench. But they didn't hit him. I always wondered about that. They couldn't have got him all. So he fell in the trench, and the guy fell over him. And then they left. Well, he got up and walked out of there. Now that's plain luck. All of them the rest were dead. Plain lucky. I'm very grateful I got a chance to talk to you. Any questions? He said, did the B-24 and B-17 have this uh, the same missions, the same targets. We all had the same. Uh, they weren't always together. We didn't fly together all the time, but most of the time we did. We just think of uh, a thousand planes at five miles up, and you see jet streams. All you see is jet streams. Oh, the what the pictures on the side of the plane? They're, they're painted over in England. They, and if you want something painted on your, uh, they got guys that do that. You give them so much money, they do that. Uh, and, the worst part, I, I'll never get this one plane with, and that's still public, you can still see it, delectable doors. It's a big, it's a big um, lady there, and I just, uh, and naturally she doesn't have any clothes on. Uh, and I, I, I didn't like to fly next to that plane. Very disturbing. <laughs> Washed out, people, those that washed out, they stayed in the Air Force, but they didn't fly. Yeah, they didn't go to the infantry, they stayed in the Air Force. They become, uh, they still flew, but not as pilots. You want to know where the co-pilot was when I, on when I, my first mission? 
and he was he was in the same plane. That was my crew, our crew. How long was it after takeoff did we get to go to the, get the target? It was normally around 11 or 12 o'clock at noon, at noon time. It was around, normally we were hitting the targets around noon. Yeah. But takeoff, it took us four, four hours just to assemble up above. Just think of all those planes have to assemble. The lead goes up and then planes just taking off all over East Anglia, that's Northeast England. It took us four hours to form before you start heading east. He's asking, uh, because at, at, when, early in the war, your tour was 25 missions. And it's easier to explain that we had no per, fighter protection. If we, without, we didn't have the 51s to protect them because it couldn't last that long. And after they got fuel tanks, so they, that's why they made it to 35. So that's why I ended up flying 35 missions. They're asking, yeah, that came out in some story, yeah. Where I lost an engine over the target, they, I lost one engine over the target. Yeah, I'll tell you that one too. That, I forget where it was, but I hit one engine. So I had three engines. And I couldn't stay up with the group. But we had dropped our bombs already. But so I had to leave the group. Uh, when you leave, when you're out by yourself, boy, you're a sitting duck for the fighters. So anyway, when I looked for clouds, I got in the clouds. I asked the navigator, give me directions back to the base. And uh, I stayed in the, I, I flew instruments all the way out of Paris. Then I, English Channel, and I saw England. I tell the boys, the first airstrip you see, let me know where it is so I can land this thing. Uh, uh, because we're losing altitude all the time. Well, the guy, one of the uh, gunners said, three o'clock, three o'clock, that's over here. So I spun it around, there's the old strip. And as I'm landing, I, I lose the other engine. Luckily on, on either side, not the same, or I'd have cracked up. I got more hugs that day, I'll tell you. <laughs> My advanced trainer in Douglas, Arizona, with a twin engine, 18-9. Beautiful ship, beautiful. How much fuel did I have in the plane when I, when I landed? You have, you have to ask my flight engineer on that one. <laughs> All I know is we're, we could last longer than the B-17, that's for sure. <laughs> did my gunners have any kills? Did they shoot down any uh, uh, enemy aircraft? Well, I'll tell you, yes, they did. But the main one, is when they shot, when they didn't shoot him, but we saw the 262 uh, German jet, the first fighter that comes up with no propellers. And I remember he hit the plane right that I was flying off of, and I see this thing come in with no props, no props. The first jet, first German jet. It shot this, a shot at this B-24, and the B-24 started doing this. And the second one right after, that 24 just slipped over on his back, just went down. And that's what normally happened. Luckily, you know, it was that guy and not me. I, did I fly the same plane all the time? No, I didn't. You were assigned a plane, so what plane to fly at briefing. And all, and um, the tails all had letters on them, A, B, C, and so forth. On D-Day, I, I was there, but I uh, just got there, so I didn't. Part I participated about a month or so later, bombing uh, parts of France. Yeah, but uh, Battle of the Bulge. You heard of the Battle of the Bulge? I was there. I was there on that one. And I, I got to mention this. And I went to France one time, Bordeaux, down to southern France. And I'm flying in elements of three, 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 three. And right in front of me, there's three. I was right the second element. And right over the target, two planes go down, get hit and go down. I, didn't see, I don't see any flak. And I said, man, those guys must be dead eyes down there. No flak. So they went down, and I, I tell the guy, I, I had 30, we had about 32 missions, 33. Almost at the end. And I said, man, I'm not gonna expose my butt to her. A guy that that dead eye, they, they hit, they shoot, they don't waste bullets, they don't waste shells, they hit you. So I tell the bomb in drop your bombs. We're not at the target yet. 
drop your bombs. So he dropped them. It wasn't much of a target anyway. So we got back, and guess what? The 17s that got in there were slow, late getting out of there, and we were early coming in. So the 17 dropped their bombs on that element of the three ships, B-24. Did we have escorts? When I got there, they had just started, the 51 escorts. They had, uh, we, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, got, got under the wings, yeah, yeah. And we were sure happy to see them, although you can hardly tell the difference. They're way up there, along with the Nazis. <laughs> you can't tell friends or foe, but we had them, yeah. Oh. Did I have keep in contact with some of the crewmates? Only one, and he passed away how long ago? 10 years, 15 years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, he passed away. Did I have the same crew? Yeah, we were together the whole time, all 10 of us. Bunch of nice boys. They're all, most were from the East Coast. Nice guys, nice guys. No, unfortunately, we didn't get together too often. My tra uh, where I did my training I repeat, uh, was uh, Fresno, in Fresno. Santa Maria, Fresno, and Douglas, Arizona. That's where I did all my training, flight training. If you go to the Lions Air Museum, I tell you again, you're innocent. You want to hear a lot of stories, real stories from people that were there. There's four veterans, flyboys. Fly There's some other guys from some other little wars there. <laughs> Dave Winsley over here. But he, he's too fast for me. He flew the fast planes. Anyway, uh, they, you're going to ask him. They, they, we have, got, we have one, two guys. One guy was shot down on the, on the tail of B-17. And he, he was in the tail when he was coming down five miles up and he was thrown out of the tail. And he woke up when he was 15,000 feet, pulled the chute. He was a POW for three or four months. Did I have fun all my life? Did I enjoy being in the service? I did, but I, I, it's one ex I like to make one exception. There were times over the target that I didn't enjoy myself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.